Every now and again, I come across a story that is just so horrifying that it really just sticks with me, it disturbs me. And today's top story is one of those. And specifically, you need to listen to the final line of today's top story to really grasp what actually happened to this poor woman. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please ride a crowded elevator with the like button and at some point turn to them and cover your nose and say, was that you? Also, please subscribe to to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. When the earth collapses in on itself, creating a hole in the ground that sucks away anything in its wake, that's called a sinkhole. These holes form when water dissolves the rock layer underneath the soil. They range dramatically in size from a barely noticeable depression in the ground to massive chasms that are hundreds of meters wide and deep. If you're one of the unfortunate few that falls into a large sinkhole, you probably won't get out again because the ground inside of a sinkhole after the initial implosion just continues to sink. So if you were standing on the ground inside of a sinkhole, you would continuously be pulled into the ground as it continued to crumble and churn like quicksand below your feet. And even if you managed to get to the sides inside of the sinkhole, you could not climb up again because there wouldn't be any handholds because the soil is all loose and wet. Luckily, most sinkholes form slowly and show lots of warning signs, allowing people to get away before it opens up. But there are unique circumstances where large sinkholes can appear out of nowhere. In Russia, hot water is piped into business and residential buildings during the harsh winters. On November 19th, 2019, in the Russian city of Penza, which is 340 miles south of Moscow, a large hot water pipe burst underground below a car park. Initially, nobody knew the pipe had burst, but witnesses would later say they saw steam coming out of the ground near the car park, but they didn't think anything of it. A few minutes after the steam appeared, 49-year-old Vladimir Valyelkin was driving his car through the car park. With him was his co-worker, 53-year-old Igor Chikasov. They worked together at a furniture store. As they made their way towards the exit of this car park, Park, there was another car ahead of them that rolled over that section of pavement that was steaming and they watched as it rolled over and drove off and nothing happened and so Vladimir and Igor they drove over that section of pavement and the ground collapsed under them. The burst hot water pipe had injected thousands of gallons of water into the soil right under the pavement and so it caused a sinkhole but not just any sinkhole, a sinkhole that was slowly filling with boiling water. When the ground collapsed under Igor's car, it flipped the car forward and it landed upside down at the bottom of this 10 meter deep sinkhole. And it landed just perfectly to where the doors could not open. They would hit the sides of the sinkhole, which also meant they couldn't roll the windows down and crawl out because they would hit the sides of the sinkhole. The men managed to get their seatbelts off and flip themselves around and began kicking on the windshield and yelling out for help. At this point, onlookers had made it to the edge of the sinkhole and when they looked down inside they realized there was nothing anyone could do jumping in was a death sentence so they watched in horror as vladimir and igor desperately tried to escape but the scalding water continued to fill the hole until it began leaking into the cabin of the vehicle at which point the men went quiet a few moments later, the car completely disappeared from view under the boiling water. Although not held criminally responsible, the water company that owned the pipe that burst offered to pay compensation to both families as well as cover all funeral costs. The northern end of New Zealand's South Island is a chaos of bays and sounds, and within this intricate coastline lies a narrow stretch of water called the French Pass, and it has a deadly secret. In 1827, French Admiral Jules Derville was mapping the coastline of South Island when he instructed his navigator to enter the pass. As Derville's crew was entering the narrowest section of the pass, they lost control of their ship and they began spinning. They eventually hit some rocks which cracked their hull, but luckily they came to rest on a nearby reef which prevented them from sinking. After the incident, Derville went back to France and in his report, he said no one should enter the French pass unless in an emergency situation because as Derville and his crew learned firsthand, the French pass is home to some of the world's most deadly whirlpools, which are exactly like the swirling tubes of water going down your drain after a bath, but these are just much larger and will kill you. 
Now, these French Pass whirlpools are only really dangerous when the tides are actively changing, because during that time, a current rips through the waterway that increases the speed and violence of the whirlpool. Once the transition is complete and it becomes fully high tide or fully low tide, or even during slack tide, the current slows down so dramatically that the whirlpools more or less vanish. So today, mariners do go through the French Pass, but they'll only go through during high, low, or slack tide. If they miscalculate the tides, and get caught in a whirlpool, they could be dragged over the rocks, just like Admiral Derville and his crew. Now, while sailing through the pass is certainly hazardous, it's nothing compared to the risks of scuba diving through the pass. If a scuba diver mistimes the tides and gets sucked into a whirlpool, they won't get dragged over the rocks. They'll get pulled straight down to the bottom where they'll be funneled into these ultra deep holes that line the sea floor. The deepest of these holes is called Jacob's Hole and it goes down over 100 meters. On March 10th, 2000, seven experienced divers headed out to the French Pass to begin their fifth week of instruction in their dive master course. With a dive master certification, they would become professional divers. This day, as part of their curriculum, they needed to complete what's called a drift dive, where instead of trying to fight the current, you simply go with it. These seven divers, which were six students and one instructor, would all be tethered to the same 30 meter long line that had handholds evenly spaced throughout it. On one end of this line was attached a buoy, and then connected to the buoy was an inflatable raft. This allowed surface observers in the boat to track the progress of the dive. The plan was to boat out to the middle of the pass during high tide, jump in the water, and then ride the slow current out of the pass again, avoiding all the whirlpools. So at high tide, a boat took the seven divers out to the middle of the pass. They all sat on the edge of the boat with their fins hanging off towards the side of the water. They clipped into that line, made sure their gear was good to go. They looked at each other, gave the okay symbol. They jumped into the water. As soon as they hit the water, they removed all the air from their compensators and their life jackets and then when they were ready, they looked at each other, gave the thumbs down, and they went subsurface. One of these student divers' husbands, a man named Hallett Smith, who had previously completed the dive master course, was in the boat as a safety observer. And he said as soon as the group got in the water and they went subsurface, immediately their buoy and raft took off at a rapid pace. Smith had to tell the boat driver to speed up just to keep pace with the divers, but after only a minute or two, the divers appeared to just stop suddenly in the water, and the inflatable raft started spinning in circles. When they drove over to the raft to see what was going on, Smith looked down and realized what had happened. The buoy and the line attached to it that all the divers were holding onto had ripped off of the inflatable raft and been sucked under the surface out of view. It would turn out the lead instructor had gotten the tides wrong and nobody had noticed. When the divers jumped into the water, it was not high tide like the instructor said it would be. It was changing from high tide to low tide, which meant instead of there being a one or two knot current, perfect for a drift dive, there was a six knot current ripping through the waterway that sucked them under. And for reference, any current that's above three knots is basically physically impossible to swim out of. So all these divers could do was ride it out and hope the current spat them out before pushing them into a whirlpool but unfortunately that didn't happen. All seven divers were pulled directly into the worst whirlpool of all because it sat over Jacob's hole and down they went all the way down to 100 meters at the bottom of this hole where they were pinned until eventually the whirlpool began releasing them. Back on the surface, Smith, along with the other rescue boats he had called in once he realized this was an emergency, began hauling the divers out of the water one by one when they popped up on the surface floating face down. Six divers surfaced, four were badly shaken up but were alive. One of them was the lead instructor. Two had drowned. That was 40-year-old Ricky McDonald and Smith's wife, 33-year-old Narelle Tapuri. As for the seventh and final diver, 21-year-old David Welsh, his body was never found. So that's led some people to believe he may still be trapped at the bottom of Jacob's Hole. The lead instructor who had gotten the tides wrong and the dive shop that employed him were both charged with negligence and had to pay a fine. After the accident, there was a big push to ban scuba diving in the French Pass, but it didn't hold. Today, it's up to each diver to make sure they never go in the pass when the tides are changing. Pelican Valley is a beautiful remote section of backcountry in Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. Its meandering meadows and creeks and 360 degree view of the mountains make it appear like the perfect place to camp out under the stars. But unlike other areas of the park, Pelican Valley requires a special permit if you intend to stay the night. And before Yellowstone Park Rangers give you this permit, they remind you that Pelican Valley is a very dangerous place. 
and in general, you should only be out there with groups of at least four people. On July 28, 1984, 25-year-old Brigitta Fredenhagen, along with her brother Andreas and her sister-in-law Junko, arrived at Yellowstone National Park. That night, they stayed in one of the park's more established campgrounds called Grant Village. The following day, they headed out to one of the park's famous hot springs called the Norris Geyser. That afternoon, before heading back to their campsite, they made a pit stop at the park ranger's office so Brigitta could apply for a Pelican Valley permit. Her plan was to spend the following night in the valley. When they went in the office, the rangers believed all three of them were applying for a permit, and so they weren't asking that many questions, and they were just kind of going through the routine. And then when Brigitte said, no, it's just gonna be me applying for a permit, they actually immediately tried to dissuade her and said, this is a really bad idea. Nobody goes into Pelican Valley on their own. But Brigitte assured them that she was an experienced camper, she understood the risks, and she still wanted to go on her own. And Andreas and Jonko, who were standing behind her, kind of echoed that sentiment and said, no, she's really good, she knows what she's doing. The park rangers were not thrilled with her plan, but they ultimately decided, you know what, if she wants to go, she can go. They just asked her to show them on a map where she intended to camp, so if they needed to, they could come and check on her and make sure she was okay. And so she pointed to a section on the map, and they handed her her permit, and then she, along with Andreas, and Jonko left the office and headed back to their campsite. The next morning, the trio got up early and they hopped in the car and drove to the Pelican Valley trailhead. They parked their car, they got out, and they began walking into Pelican Valley as a group. After a few miles, as planned, the group stopped, at which point Andreas told Brigitta that they were gonna head back now and that they would meet her tomorrow at the trailhead where they parked the car. They said their goodbyes, and then Andreas and Jonko turned around and started walking back towards the car, and Brigitta carried on into the wilderness. The following day, Andreas and Jonko arrived at the trailhead to meet Brigitta, but she didn't show up. And after a couple of hours, they grew very concerned, so they called park rangers and asked them, you know, have you seen Brigitte? And they said, no, but we'll go take a look. The area Brigitte had told park rangers she was going to be camping was inside of a densely forested area right next to a large meadow, which meant as park rangers came up to check on her, they would not actually be able to see her until they were practically right on top of her. So the park rangers made their way through the meadow and into the forest before they started yelling for Brigitte, but she didn't yell back. And then at some point they reached the area where she had said she was camping. And sure enough, they found her tent but it was a very odd scene. When they came up to the tent, they could see there was a big tear in one side. When they put their heads down and looked inside, all of her belongings in the tent were undisturbed. There was a foam sleeping mat right in the middle, and then to the right of the mat was a flashlight that had been turned off. On the left side of the pad was a tape player with headphones that she must have been listening to before bed. It had been left on until the batteries ran out. At the foot of the pad was her backpack, inside of which were all of her clothes that had been neatly packed inside of Ziploc bags to mask her scent. Also in the pack was a wilderness survival guide with a page flipped down that was a diagram of how to string your food up into the trees so no animals can get to it. The rangers looked around the back side of the tent about two meters away and they found her sleeping bag perfectly flat on the ground as if it had been laid out to dry in the sun but upon closer inspection they found it had two puncture marks one that was up near the neck of the bag and the other that was near the torso but there was no blood on the bag at this point rangers started to speculate that this could have been an animal attack but they were confused at the general tidiness of the scene Typically, when an animal attacks a person, it looks like a bomb went off in the area where the attack occurred, and this campsite was very, very neat. As the rangers continued to walk around the campsite looking for clues and yelling out for Brigitte, they found a barely discernible drag tail a couple of meters away from the sleeping bag that was leading west into the forest and up a hill. And so the rangers started following this trail and they got about 20 meters away from the camp when they discovered Brigitte's cooler lying on the ground on its side and whatever food had been in there was now gone. There was some string laying next to it so it looked like it had been strung up in the trees but someone or something had gotten it down. From the cooler, the rangers continue walking along this drag trail another 20 meters or so up a hill where they discover a woman's sweater on the ground that's been torn up and there's blood on it. So at this point, the rangers get their rifles up and they keep walking another 40 meters up and over the hill down into this clearing in the woods where they find Brigitte or what was left of her. No one knows exactly what happened to Brigitte, but the theory based on physical evidence is this. After setting up her campsite, Brigitte climbed inside of her tent, got inside of her sleeping bag, and then put her headphones on to listen to music. A little while later, a male grizzly bear discovered Brigitte cooler strung up in the trees about 20 meters away. And apparently Brigitte did not string it high enough because the bear was able to reach up and pull it down. After the bear ate the food inside of the cooler, it was still hungry. So it began looking around the area for more to eat. It's believed
believed this bear was so accustomed to human traffic in the area that when he stumbled across Brigida's tent, he wasn't scared. In fact, he thought, there's food inside of there. There's people I can eat. So this bear quietly lumbers over to the side of the tent. It reaches up and cuts the nylon with its paw. And then it puts its head inside and bites down on Brigida's skull and begins dragging her away. There was no sign of a struggle in or near the tent, indicating that Brigida was most likely asleep, or maybe she just could not hear the bear because she still had her headphones in. She was dragged 80 meters by her skull to that clearing where she was consumed. An attack like this is exactly the reason why Pelican Bay is considered so dangerous, because it's full of grizzly bears. And even though grizzly attacks on humans are incredibly rare, most people do not understand just how horrific they are when they do occur. Grizzly bears don't really try to kill their prey before they eat them. Instead, they focus on pinning them down and then getting them under their body weight so they can't go anywhere, at which point they can eat them at a leisurely pace. Some say grizzlies actually prefer to eat their prey while they're still living, which is why so often in grizzly attacks, you see the arms and legs eaten first and then the head and torso. This is a method that keeps the victim alive a little bit longer. Unfortunately, there was so little left of Brigida that investigators could not pinpoint a time of death. However, because this bear broke normal behavior and intentionally targeted a human, there's a good chance he savored that meal. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please ride a crowded elevator with the like button. And after the door shut, turn to face them, cover your nose and say, was that you? Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.